Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. At The Reason We Learn, we aspire to be part of the solution. The purpose of this show is to take a good, honest, potentially painful look at the way kids are being educated. We know we can do better, and this is where we'll talk about how. Let's learn something. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. I'm so glad you've joined me here today. I've got a great show for you. Really great. I'm so excited for this one. Uh, if you are new to the channel and interested in being part of the solution to our education crisis, I hope you will subscribe to be notified when I make new content or host shows like this. Please like and share this broadcast specifically so others can benefit from the information we're about to share. This one, this show is, it might well be one of the most important shows I've done in a long time because I'm speaking with a teacher. And this is a teacher who has some very interesting thoughts on education, specifically teaching and school choice. And I've asked him here today because he has some original thoughts on it that I sort of am embarrassed I didn't think of in all of my arguments against the current iteration of school choice and even just in you know, advancing separation of school and state um, that have to do with teaching. But uh, as you know, each of these shows that I bring you is an opportunity to hear from people who are working to improve education in America. Although I would say that Dan is just working to improve education in general, and he doesn't even teach in America, but what he's teaching us, I hope will will improve it. Dan Clemens, is a Canadian-born international teacher. As an undergraduate in philosophy, he was a Marxist atheist. He is now in recovery from that. He initially gravitated towards critical theory in the Frankfurt School. We're going to ask him about that. And he did his master's thesis on Marcuse and Frome. He went on to teach in South Korea for two years and then returned home to Canada to enter a PhD program. But he found it to be woke. Marxist found it to be woke. That is focused on critique and social transformation. That was what he was noticing in his PhD program. Ways of knowing, things like that. So he became disillusioned. I shouldn't say so because many don't, but he did. He became disillusioned and he had a different kind of political awakening. So rather than going into the woke, he was moving away from it. He lost faith in his program and he started weighing his options. What should he do? And that exploration led him to voluntarily withdraw from it, to go to education school, and then back to teach in Asia, where he remains. He's now in his fourth year teaching in China. And I have asked him to come here today and talk with us because I've, I've followed him on Twitter for a while and noticed some of his posts and we agree on a fair number of things. But he published an article yesterday in his uh, Dan's newsletter Substack, entitled School Choice and the Trappings of Woke. And I, I was I was really blown away by this, by the ideas that he shared. I'm just going to read one one thought to you, just the beginning part of it, and then I'm going to introduce and bring him on. He says, You've probably heard the new adage that people in hospitals don't get well meaning get them out of there as soon as you can so they can get well at home. The medical and educational institutions of the West seem to be failing us in some ways. So if I wonder if people will start saying this about schools, young people in schools don't get well educated, meaning get them out of there as soon as you can so they can get well educated at home. What is school choice really about? What is the school choice trap? As I see it, when there is one ruling pedagogy, critical pedagogy, there is only one type of teacher it produces, and thus only one type of school. So no real choice, but a false choice. What do parents want? From a non-parent teacher's perspective, I'd like to suggest it's really all about choice of teacher type at root. Parents want a born teacher. Parents want a born teacher. Think about that. So with that, 
I am about to introduce you to a born teacher, Dan Clemens. Hello, Hi. Dan. Good evening from me and good morning to you. That's right. You are in China. So thank you so much for doing this show. I read that and just stopped. And it, you ever have a realization where like, oh, blah, 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 duh. <laughs> I mean, amazing. Amazing. But I'm sure my audience is now going, what, how, how did this guy, what Marx is, it, how did you get here? But let's start before that. What I'm curious what appealed to you initially about the Frankfurt School and Marxism? Because it's really important for us to understand. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's a, it's a, it's a real privilege. Um, I appreciate it very much. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm, I was drawn, you know, first to atheism. Um, and, and in some ways there's just, um, you know, there's a, a kind of a teenage rebellion that can manifest itself in, you know, kind of, typical acting out bad behaviors, but there's also a kind of rebellion that is that takes on a more of an intellectual form. Um, it's sort of the old uh, James Dean rebel without a cause. Well, you know, what are you against? Well, what do you got? And so I was in Catholic school, um, Catholic family, and that was kind of the kind of the most obvious, you know, outlet or avenue. Um, and it has this, you know, atheism has its own intellectual tradition. And this is when I was coming up, it was this great revival of the new atheists and, you know, Christopher Hitchens uh, and other really kind of smart, interesting people. And it's very attractive. Um, Marxism, though, I think, you know, the phrase that I think of with what is so attractive to the young sort of university age students is an unearned moral superiority. Uh, it's a way that you think of yourself and you distinguish yourself from other people um, by having this kind of special insight that you put on this, these sort of glasses and you're able to see the world in this way that basically, you know, the first probably big Marxist idea that draws people in is this idea of alienation, right? That other people are alienated from, uh, from themselves and from one another and from their work and from reality and from the whole, whatever idea that humanity is supposed to be. Other people might think that they're free or they think that they're happy, but really that's just because they don't, um, recognize the alienation. Whereas, you know, we, and so I was woke before woke was woke, you might say. Um, and as a way to understand this, I think of, um, you know, the film, The Matrix, where you know, everyone is kind of living in this sleepy dream world simulation. And then only some people kind of, they get unplugged and then they're able to experience the sort of real reality that they have their eyes opened. Um, and I, so I think that it kind of comes down to that uh, and sort of what's so attractive about Marxism. Wow. I mean, it. I suppose that doesn't really surprise me, but as a parent, and I'm sure there are parents out there who send their kids to Catholic school in particular, I, I didn't, but I'm just saying as a parent, I hear this and I think given that, and given that's probably a natural urge for rebellious teenagers or even any teenager, they don't have to be particularly rebellious. Parents may wonder, well, what, what could I do? What could schools do, et cetera, to um, be less inspiring of rebellion? I mean, there's rebellion and there's rebellion, right? So if you're trying to raise your child with your values or religion, for example, or you want to send them to a school where they'll help you do that. Um, I don't think any parent says, I'm going to send them to the Catholic school to get good and frustrated, feeling like there's, a, you know, they're oppressed and they need to break free and think something completely different than, right? So I just wonder, like, could one, could one have gone to your Catholic school and not felt the way you did, do you think? Or you think it was just the nature of, of how it was. Sure. It, it definitely didn't have to, to work itself out that way. Um, in some ways, I think it was sort of um, just a, an intellectually expressive outlet for me um, that I, I, I guess um, religion itself kind of became old hat that I didn't recognize that there is like a, a really rich intellectual tradition in the church. Uh, and my, my high school is actually called St. Paul. It's kind of considered one of the great sort of, you know, um, intellectual you know, writers. Um, but I think that was probably never communicated to me. You know, I had a high school English teacher who I remember was criticizing the, we have a, a mandatory religion class in, in high school. 
And he kind of said, like, think of all the great things that you could be learning and how kind of rich and stimulating it could be. But instead, these religion classes, these mandatory courses are so, uh, there's so much fluff. They just tell you to be friends and to be kind. Um, and this really kind of like soft, um, you know, feel good kind of stuff. But it doesn't really, you know, sink its teeth into um, some of these deeper meanings. Uh, and so when you're in, I think, in a religious context, and you're interested in, in looking at bigger questions, and I became interested in philosophy. And there's also just most of the really accessible kind of pop culture philosophers are also quite atheistic. Um, you know, like you, you, from like Darwin isn't really a philosopher, a natural philosopher. So, you know, Darwin and uh, Marx and Freud to an extent and Nietzsche, um, that there's just something, there's just something, um, you know, appealing or, or attractive about these thinkers. And also it's, it's more and more the case that, I mean, you could argue that it's not rebellious at all because education and educators more and more are more left leaning. Uh, and so if, if you become more leftist through your educational experiences, then um, especially in, in colleges and universities where uh, professors are in, in an American context, mostly all going to be Democrat, I suppose. Right. So in that sense, it would be almost more conforming. I think I want, I, I'm, I'm still processing what you said about uh, the moral superiority, mm -hmm. that sense of, do you think there's a natural drive in humans, in all humans, not just young ones, um, to, to, to feel like a good per or to feel like they are worthy or they're a good person and that would, that would drive some to want to grab hold very quickly to a philosophy that gives them that, that just says, here you go, believe these things and you are morally superior. I think that everyone and certainly including young people, they want to excel uh, in something. And very often it's hard to know exactly what that's going to be. Not everyone is going to be the, you know, the captain or quarterback of the football team. Right. And so there has to be something that you can sort of, um, you know, attach your identity to as something that marks you as, as you know, unique or special in some way. Mm -hmm. And for me, I mean, I was much more, I, I gravitated more towards, you know, intellectual type things. Mm -hmm. um, but in some ways, I, I don't know, it's hard to really prove to everybody, I guess, how, how smart you are. And part of proving how smart you are is also just this idea that you've got reality figured out. And it's kind of uh, what we might call a flex that, you know, more than you do. And, um, you know, the ultimate expression of that is I know the way the whole world is supposed to be. And I know the, the way that the world is, the way that the economy is organized and structured is all wrong. Uh, it, it's, it's exploitative and alienating and oppressing. And um, so it's a way to show um, a uh, kind of an intellectual superiority um, but also a kind of a, a kind of a moral sensitivity combined with that at the same thing. And I, I guess that it's that combination uh, for people who aren't, you know, you're not, you know, super popular or super athletic and you just start looking for, uh, for ways to, to excel. That's, I think that's true. I think that's true. It seems like then there's a, there's a lack of epistemic humility. And if you add to that, in other words, if a child goes to school where the teachers are lacking in humility, then are they teaching children to think for themselves or are they likely to simply be indoctrinating? Like uh, if they have it figured out and they project and they say, I have it figured out, I would think one of two things happens. Either the student who might look up to the teacher or at least defer so they get the grade, right? takes that on or rebels. So, you know, you have the stories of the Catholic school, like this is the way the world works and, you know, ruler to the, and then I can see a child saying, what do you know? Right. And going 180 degrees the other way or conversely saying, well, the sister said, and therefore, um, I think what parents are seeing now is that their schools by and large in the United States anyway, I can't speak to Canada because I'm not Canadian, but I have heard stories. It's similar um, that uh, they're seeing teachers today be like a almost like Gnostic nuns, <laughs> if that makes sense, where they yeah, have 
they have the answers. And yeah, that, that makes me think this, um, as you, like, as you're growing up, you want to show how much you're changing and sort of transforming, right? Almost in a way that kind of relates to the kind of runs analogous to these physical changes, right? Um, that, you know, I'm not the same as I was before when I was young, I believed in God and I, you know, I don't know, I went to church and, and, and whatever else. Uh, but you know, that's just, you know, I, I'm not like that anymore. Um, and there's also just something in our culture that rewards skepticism more than faithfulness, right? That like whenever anybody says anything, even if it seems kind of obviously true, there's this cleverness game that I think a lot of people learn how to play. And I think universities probably do this better than anything else. They teach this cleverness game that even some really obvious things, they, well, you know, like it might not actually be that way. That could just be a, a matter of your perception or a matter of your conditioning. Uh, but ba but basically to kind of stick with the same kind of sturdy, solid, you know, tried, tested and true kinds of things and to maintain that consistency. Um, oh, you, you know, you, you still think that you still believe that, um, that it, that it, it's almost like certain things are supposed to become passe. You're supposed to abandon them, become skeptical of them and sort of doubt everything. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's unclear that it's, that that's the, the best approach. And now enter Kant. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that's all. That's all we need is kids <laughs> being introduced to that. Um, anyway, I I find this so fascinating because I do remember being a teenager, and I remember you know all kinds of feelings and thoughts I had in school, but I was missing this. It, it's all. It's like talking about another species to me because I didn't have that. I had. I didn't have that that particular kind of rebellion at all. Um, I asked a lot of questions of my teachers, but never about, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't have that sense that either I had, that I had to know everything. It never occurred to me that this was something I was supposed to, or should want to do. Right. So being able to say, I don't know, or I haven't figured it out yet was not really difficult. That wasn't, in fact, I found myself more often than not, trying to school my parents <laughs> in that and say, you know, but, you know, may, maybe, maybe not. Maybe we should ask more questions, not skeptical, ask more questions like you're wrong, but just why do you have to be so certain? Yeah. You know, so there's this, what I'm hearing you say is that on the one hand, they have this cleverness of I'm going to be skeptical about everything, but they're so certain in their skepticism. In other words, it's not, just I'm sincerely curious, like, what if it weren't true? Let's pl do play out the hypothetical with the sincere intention of finding, the, of no, you know, like proving that what I think I know is true. Like, I want to prove the sun rises in the east because I've been, been told that I'm willing to believe that. But I just want to double check. Right. There's that. And then there's the I'm just going to sit here and say it doesn't until I wear you down because that's the clever, fun thing to do. Right. And that I didn't have that. I didn't have that. Your way is wrong. And I know, and it, like, they're very, very certain in their movement towards chaos. Everything you think, you know, is wrong. I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, what I'm chaos, saying. Yeah. Chaos and, and order, I think are behind a lot of these things, but I think what you're describing in terms of yourself, I mean, the word that comes to my mind is, you know, the word explorer. Uh, really wanting to kind of get to things and, you know, figuring out the answers. Um, a lot of people, I mean, exploring is, I mean, it's very sort of labor intensive. Um, it's much easier. I mean, that's probably the hardest path to take. It's much easier either to just stick with what you've been told or to just reject everything in those two extremes. And, you know, what you're describing is just like sort of a, I would say a very healthy, well-adjusted middle path. And you know, what's so funny. I don't see it that way. Isn't it weird? Like what, whatever you are is just what you are, right? So I appreciate that because it sort of sounds a little like a compliment, right? But I would find it enormously difficult to maintain that air of superiority and, you know, I know everything and everybody else is stupid and, you know, this, you know, you're old and I, you know, I'm new and I know better than, you know, because you're crusty. Like that feels like if I, picture it. And even when I was a kid, seeing other people do it, I was like, that's so much work. You, there's a, there's a persona you have to build and maintain 
and support right down to your clothes that you wear, the the attitudes of music you listen to, the books you read. Like you don't have any freedom. You're you're constrained just as you would be if you were in that the, that Catholic school marm or was like I must do these things and only read the Bible or whatever. To me, it feels like a religion of the most strict order to do what they're doing. To do what to do what you were describing of this rebellion, but at this level now with wokeism, I look at these people I'm like, oh my god, you must be exhausted. Like I could, I couldn't keep up the farce. Yeah, but thankfully, you know, I discovered philosophy as an academic study, and I studied philosophy for a decade, and so that was, you know, I was able to have that. Um, I'm what some people might have called more of a champagne socialist, just in the sense that I was sort of, I was, I was hands off. I mean, you know, I had the, the cliche Guevara t-shirt and I was friendly with all the campus activists. Uh, and I went to some, you know, some, you know, activist little, you know, uh, gatherings, organizings. Uh, but for the most part, I, I, I think I tried to, you know, exercise a lot of these things much more or process them more intellectually. And, you know, so I, I wasn't really all that drawn to activism um, because, yeah, I, I think that the study of philosophy itself actually helped to mellow me out. And I wasn't I wasn't really a, a radical extremist um, unless I could write an essay about radicalism or extremism. And that like that was the way that it that it, that it manifested. Um, so there was a there was a there's a kind of a certainty and a confidence that's true. But, you know, for me, it didn't it wasn't really that same really like hot, passionate intensity of like needing to, I don't know, to, to go out and take some sort of direct action. Um, right. Yeah, it's more hands off. Yeah. I think that's important to note that even today's students who are woke or even today's teachers who are woke still come in flavors, you know, so you've got those who are organizers and activists and they see their role in the school is to breed new activists. And then on the flip side, you've got kids who are like, what do you want on the test? Okay, I'll get an A if I say that. Okay, fine. You know, like they don't, they're not all sold or bought in, but they, they go along with it because that's what you do. They're doing school. Right. Um, and if I had to guess, I would say, and maybe, you know, tell me what you think that it's probably about the same percentages that it always was, you know, there, you've got your percentage of hardcore true believers and whatever's being taught. You've got your percentage of, I'm just here for the, you know, the conversation in recess. And then, you know, the, the, the others who are like, no way, no how this is garbage. And they're a very small group, but would you, would you agree? It's kind of breaks down like that, no matter where you are. To, to an extent, um, but I think that the the incentive structure has changed. Ooh, okay. That I think that that there, I think that there used to be much more of a cost to be paid for activism. That an activist is in some way taking a risk. That they're that, that you're kind of putting yourself out there in such a way that um, you know that that could have some some damaging effect on you. Um, I mean, to be a to be a Marxist on a university today, you're not going to be you know, blacklisted or anything like that. Uh, so like those, like those kinds of things change. And um, yeah, almost, we've almost seen the complete reversal. And uh, it's almost kind of unfortunate because we do want to have activists who are on the margins and who are talking about things in, in ways that other people don't. Um, but what's happened is this kind of, this new institutionalized activism that still, this is one of my kind of hobby horses that you know, if you're, uh, if it's, if it's conforming to what you're supposed to, um, like you said, um, or teachers who are, you know, following, you know, um, you know, school board consultant handouts and, you know, they're just kind of following what they're supposed to be doing, uh, then that's, there's no way that that's activism, right? Like, I think that right now, for example, in my profession, that the anti-woke people, for example, uh, the ones that are afraid to speak up because of the cost that it could have to them, that they're the activists now, they're the counterculture now uh, that the institution's been captured. That is accurate. And that's how it feels. It feels very dangerous. <laughs> um, but that's interesting. Do you think that there would be perhaps a, a turnaround because of that, because of the way that the pendulum swings and so forth? Do you think that in and of itself? Well, I mean, just personally for me, I actually 
in a strange way, I owe the activists for helping me to see the way out. Just so, so the story, like the, there were a bunch of little things, but one of the big things um, was uh, it was, you know, summertime and um, it was when the Charlie Hebdo, the, mm -hmm. the French cartoon massacre happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was well. obviously horrible. And I remember seeing my, you know, my old undergraduate activist friends posting on Facebook. This is when young people still used Facebook and saying that basically they deserve to die for the sin of racism. And that was that was a that was a kind of a, a focal point in my kind of political reawakening that there's just kind of this this obsession, this this moral purity, purity and um, this obsession with racism and I kind of saw that and I was like, yeah, it, it made me realize that I just wasn't on the right side of, of something, of whatever it was, right. and that there was something really suspicious then to me about these, about some of these political allegiances. And some right. of the things were just, were just a lot of, um, the other thing was the whole, the whole rise of Trump and how I saw that, I, I suspected that so much of the hatred and vitriol for a lot of my more sort of left wing uh, leaning people and most of the people that I that I knew and associated with, that it really wasn't about Trump. It was just kind of a hatred for the like for the average normal person, um, basically the, the kind of people, the proletariat, the workers who, you know, the, the Marxist you know, type, we're supposed to sort of liberate them. And uh, maybe there was a kind of a, a jealousy or sort of an animus towards this more, more more populous kind of thing that was doing something that all of the you know woke professors in universities they they're supposed to be the ones leading the working class. Uh, but anyway, I just saw this real hatred just for you know for, for cartoonists getting murdered or just for like the average the Joe six pack kind of thing. And I just thought that this is so. Um, there's a way that Jordan Peterson talks about this, about the, this kind of like young left-wing uh, radical type is that they seem on the surface to hate, to, sorry, to love the poor. But when you get just below the surface, they don't love the poor, they hate the rich. And that that is, once you kind of clue into that side of it, it's like, okay, that this is, this isn't what I always thought. It's not as pure as I thought it was. Right. I, yeah, I, I, I definitely see the hate, the rich part, but you've opened my eyes a little bit to the, the part about how they wanted to be the ones who were, you know, leading the popular, leading the workers or so forth and probably are feeling like betrayed, you know, like, wait a minute, you, you people who work in factories and mines and so forth and, you know, day job, you're not supposed to like somebody on the right. And it's ironic because in the United States, Donald Trump was always a Democrat. I mean, he was a Democrat when I was growing up. He was friends with the Clintons. He was, you know, it, it wasn't somebody I would have looked at as a conservative, as a Republican. I mean, the guy's been married a bunch of times. I mean, he doesn't have any of those family values trappings or anything. It just, the idea that people were suddenly calling him a racist and all these, I was like, I grew up in New York City. So for me, I knew who Donald Trump was and wasn't. And I wasn't a fan, straight up. I wasn't a fan. I was trying to tell people at the primary time, like, what, what are you doing? You know, this guy? But I didn't say it for the reasons that the people who hated him said it. They had a whole new set of reasons. I'm like, that dude? What? <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's very, very strange. You know, the religious right and Donald Trump. I'm like, uh, what? You know, that was just so strange. But um, but that's that's really fascinating. You've, you've given me more more to think about. I feel like between your articles and this conversation, I'm going to have all kinds of new things to think about. Um, but I appreciate you sharing your background and perspective about where you came from, how you changed and the philosophy. One final question on this section, and I want to talk a little bit more about your article. Um, do you think it would be a worthwhile thing for all students at a certain age to study philosophy? I think so. Yes. Uh, but certainly I would consider theology to be a subset of philosophy. And so if it was a study of theology, um, then I would certainly consider that to be, uh, yeah, to be great. Um, I mean, if I had my way, it would be in high schools. Um, uh, we, um, in my uh, curriculum, I mean, it's it's an available course, but it really depends on if there's enough students interested in it. Uh, I think it's sort of, it can be kind of intimidating. Uh, but definitely, I think that it's just, um, in some ways, 
it's it can be more accessible to more like straight analytically thinking like i think that you know people maybe they go into something like they'll either love their english classes that are or art classes or whatever that are more kind of kind of free flowing in some way uh, or they gravitate towards like stem and math and science um, philosophy is a great mixture of both because it is literary but it's also i mean there's a whole logic to it and sort of working through arguments and if you know if this is true and that's true then this has to be true as well and so philosophy really has like the best of of both of those worlds i think um and so i think that people who feel like you know maybe students they feel like they really have to go towards some of these really um kind of like softer humanities or these really hard sciences uh, i think that philosophy is this um in some ways it it connects and unifies those things and that there's a just as there's a history to everything i mean there's a history to physics and there's a there's art history as well um there's also a philosophy to everything too and so it's i i think any any kind of course that you know brings younger people into a bigger world and to just kind of see you know how deep the rabbit hole goes um is is a great thing and i think philosophy definitely checks that box i, have, I agree with you and i think it also uh it also would help kids start to think about meaning and forming you know and identifying meaning in their own lives without uh other adults projecting onto them. So regardless where they're cut, left, right, at any direction, I think it opens up windows so that they can start to think about the personal power they have to find meaning in life without seeking that other kind of belongingness and all that junk. Um, and okay. So when I opened up the show and I, I read people, the first statement about you being a born teacher and this, what we just finished up talking about is, kind of one of the things I think of about when I think of a born teacher is a person who is also learning a person who looks at life as an on, you know, and, and learning as an ongoing process that you're never done with. And that it is that, that you want to share with your students through the subject matter you've chosen to teach. Of course, you're teaching a subject matter, but the hope is then that I'm going to take my passion for this subject and for learning in general and I'm going to teach that to the kids. So yes, they'll come away knowing this subject or more about the subject than when they entered my class. But what I, I will feel like I've done my job if they leave my class continuing to use their minds actively the way I have modeled it for them. In other words, if they leave my class disagreeing with my opinions or you know writing about things that I wouldn't necessarily write about or whatever, that's okay provided... I genuinely feel like they are using their noodles, you know, like they're, they're actually, they know how to learn. They know how to function here. Whereas you describe something called a made teacher. And I want you to explain to people what that is. I want them to read the article. Please read the article. It's so good. But, um, you know, what is the opposite of that? So if that's a, if that's a born teacher as sort of a learner who wants it to be contagious, <laughs> then, then what is the made teacher? I think there are a lot of different ways we can think of this, but I, I guess the first question when we think about education is what should a teacher teach kids? Um, and it's, it's a deceptively simple question. A teacher should teach what they know. You can't really teach anybody about things that you don't know about. And these new uh, pedagogies that have emerged, I think have really forgotten this. And you have to base what, what you teach and, and what you know about. If you just get assigned, oh, by the way, you're teaching this next semester, then it's really on you to really learn a lot about that before you start teaching about it. But I think that this new age philosophy really wants to be timely. Whereas I think a, a born teacher that is only teaching about what they know, in some ways you focus on things that are so well established, they're timeless. So there's a, there's a distinction between timeless and timely teaching. And we've gotten way too far into this timeliness. And it's not usually used with that word. Usually it's relevant and responsive. It says that the idea is I'm not going to teach from my own knowledge base of something that I know so much about I could be an expert in. Uh, I'm just going to teach them what they need to know, not what I know. 
and then you're getting you're you're getting away from your own expertise and the purest form of authority in a classroom flows from your expertise that when you really know what you're talking about and then when students start to see that that you do um, then they don't pay attention based on any sort of disciplinary mechanism you pay attention to the teacher the way you pay attention to someone that you don't want to miss something that they might say because it might be you know interesting or illuminating or educational right uh, so that's how I think of uh, born teaching is that it's imparting wisdom, imparting knowledge, and it's passing on something, right? That um, I'm a teacher now. When I was a student, I had teachers who taught me a lot. And so you're just continuing on something new. Um, this is why, you know, the, the best the best master or expert anywhere in the world, whether it's making swords or making, you know, pie, uh, that, you know, they had someone who taught them and that person had someone before who taught them and, and on and on going back and that you continue passing something on and it kind of maintains a, a kind of a pure essence to it, but also it's open to, to refinements and improvements. So born teacher is not an original phrase to me. It's from one of my favorite oldest books that's not really all about education. The book is called To Him That Overcometh. It's uh, from 1935, and I just picked it up in a, a thrift store during ed school, and it has the whole middle section about the school, and mostly it is about the ridiculousness of education schools uh, because uh, there's, there's, there are only born teachers. There's no such thing as a made teacher. Let me read really quickly. Um, the great fallacy underlying the activities of the teacher's college is the evident conviction that teachers are made and not born. The experienced head of any school or college knows that this is not true. The real teacher is possessed from birth with God-given qualities that mark him as a teacher and that not even the best of teacher's colleges can possibly supply. So it's almost a kind of a, there's almost a kind of a libertarian flavor to what a born teacher is. It's you, you kind of use your own um, natural abilities and you you frame them in terms of teaching and just get out of my way, right? I'm a teacher. I know what I'm teaching. I know how to do it. Uh, don't try to tell me how to do it or how to structure it too much, um, that it really requires um, a kind of a, a liberty to be able to, to teach and to do it uh, in my way because it's all based on everything that I've learned about and everything that I know that informs my teaching practice. And it can't really be, uh, it can't just adopt some kind of uh, external objective standard. Um, yeah. So I hope that answers the, the question. No, no, no. It, it does. What you're describing is the difference between teaching and presenting. So mm. to me, a lot of what ed school does is produce presenters of praxis. <laughs> so, you know, they give you, you have the pedagogy, then they say, here's your lesson plan, your praxis. And then, you know, you go in and you present and we are starting to, in my opinion, mistakenly equate good teaching with good presenting. So we evaluate how good a teacher is by how engaged the students are. And engagement is measured by somebody walking past the window of the classroom and seeing kids smiling and doing and being active and that the idea is that if I walk past a room, looked in and saw, you know, 12 or 20 little kids just looking forward at the teacher, that would be terrible. That would be so wrong. We've gone from the sage on a stage, so to speak, you know, the, the teacher is, as you describe, you know, teaching and the kids are listening and soaking it in or whatever, and maybe doing some homework or something, but they're, to the teacher spends very little time doing any of that. It's mostly present. I've got a video. I've got the whiteboard. I've got all these things. And we got an activity that you're going to go do. And then the kids go and they do their thing. And this is very, very popular right now. Um, they call it student-led learning. They call it, uh, you know, student-directed. It's even popular within the homeschooling community. There's a lot of uh, shaming, quite frankly going on uh, from some people in the, even within the homeschooling community or the alternative ed community against those parents who want the classical experience, who want the sage on a stage, who want 
that born teacher who says, you know, I know a lot about the subject and I'm going to teach it to your child and so forth. The, the, I, there is some, again, people even who don't like the public school who say it's too prison-like, it's too regimented. They tell you you're going to be where, et cetera, and then all of that student-led learning is too contrived. Really, it should be the student picks what they want to learn every day and all day. And the student says, I'm going to do this activity and I'm going to read these books and I'm going to do all that. And if you come in and say, but what about the value of a classical education or reading the classics or having somebody help you understand the value of analysis and certain kinds of inquiry um, and models that? What they're, they're, you know, no, let the child, they'll figure it all out. And I... I guess I'm really biased. I'm I'm right there in that classical mode, and so when I hear both sides that are like that, I said these are these are people who have a vision of teaching that's very different from what I have. Um, do you think there are born teachers who favor the student-led model just outside of a school? Like, can when I say student-led, I mean like, what are you doing today, kid? Like this. <laughs> Uh, I, I always, I mean, my default is to think of the word inquiry, inquiry based or the inquiry model of education. Um, right. And it's in, in this whole question about active or engaged is, is really important, too. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to have a, a debate in education about ratio. How much should the teacher be talking? How much should the students be talking? Um, for example, I mean, if I'm doing something that's more strictly, you know, English language learning, um, then certainly they need to be talking more that it uh, that, the, that the language itself sort of floats on a sea of talk and they just need to practice making the sounds and, you know, making the shapes with their mouths. Um, and then there's also, you know, more, more literature based. Uh, and so the ratio can certainly change from subject to subject and even from, from teacher to teacher. Um, I think that I mean, my first thought, though, is I think of this word conservation, that, okay, if we've had, I mean, we have this great, robust civilization, and we've been doing education in a certain way for a very long time, and we have this track record of however we did education for a long time, we produced a lot of great geniuses, right? There's sort of a joke that, you know, somebody had to be William Shakespeare's English teacher, right? And so that's what that's the the conservationist in me. You could say the conservative in me um, that kind of thinks, well, you know, I had this other kind of um, more direct instruction, didactic, this this relationship with the content that's sort of facilitated through the teacher in a kind of a direct way. And so and, and my teachers, teachers also had that exper experience, too. So. I should be very uncomfortable by saying, I am now going to do something completely original. Um, that don't I want to be like, do I want to be a link in the chain that continues? Or do I really want to assume the responsibility as if I have the authority to break the chain? And so I think that these, ex as an experiment, this is great. Um, you know, doing an inquiry model, do it on a small scale, see how well it works. We should be doing experiments in education for sure. We should have experimental schools, but we shouldn't necessarily have a brand new idea that comes along and then it's sort of you know, federally mandated that everyone has to start doing it in this new way. That to me, I just, I just kind of think, um, have you really considered all of the possible, you know, the, the, the sort of opportunity cost or all of the things that you could lose in doing it this way? And, you know, young people are prone to whims. And also, you know, if, if it's something I always think with inquiry, I always think about skateboarding. I want to learn about skateboarding. Okay, good. I don't know anything about skateboarding. So you're on your own. Right. And exactly. there's, there's something else about that. You're on your own with this inquiry thing that it doesn't really give me a chance to act as sort of a, as a guide or a mentor. And it doesn't build relationships in the same way. And it also doesn't build the like the social community of the classroom as a as a learning community that they're that they're all reading the same things and that I like and they, they have the same homework and it just I think that it facilitates and opens for 
for relationships, for sort of healthy, stable relationships with the teacher and also with the class. And so I'm basically skeptical of, of, of experimentation as such and of inquiry in particular. I'm so glad you mentioned that about building classroom community and the community of learners. Um, that is so important. When I think back to my high school experience and even prior to that, when we all read the same book yeah. and, you know, some books we liked more than others, right? Some we were like, oh God, we're reading that, you know, fine. But we were all in it together, you know, and we, we read the same book. We discussed the book. Um, I learned from my peers, my peers, you know, so we could, we could not just learn from the teacher. Somebody would say something about a character or ask a question and I might not have thought of it that way. I was like, yeah. oh. So to me, even we know you hear about this diversity and all this, and I'm thinking, I feel like I experienced more diversity in terms of understanding how other people think differently than I think, reading the same book as my peers and discussing it in a class than I would with somebody dictating to me, people in the world are different. And you have to accept them all. And here's a book about that. You know, so they're learning like about, you know, other concepts or other thoughts. They're not actually living it. They're not, they're not able, I think, to integrate it because that's being just lectured at them and they don't have that community experience. The other thing that you just mentioned about um, is that they'd have the passing on with the teacher to the students. Well parents used to be able to be part of that too. Mm -hmm. So when our kid, when I went to school and I read certain books and there were a few editions and it would add something new, you know, but only a few, most of the things I read were things that my dad had read when he was in school, similar to how they taught math. So if I had a question, I needed help. I wanted to just talk about it around the dinner table with my family and say, I, this is what I learned today, which is also reinforcing the learning and reinforcing the sense that we're all part of the same community. And I don't mean just community as far as where we live, but culture, shared culture. So we feel close and we feel like we have purpose. I would say we're reading that. Oh, I love that book. Or, oh, that book was, you know, Beowulf, man, that, that was hard. You know, I remember this. So our kids are missing out on opportunities to share with their families what they're learning because they're learning not only different things, different books, but in such a dramatically different way. You hear it all the time. Parents go, I don't understand the new math. I don't know what's that. I can't even help them with their homework. So it's yeah. another wedge. They're all alone. Yeah. Um, there I'm thinking of the word reservoir and that, you know, when you've got even from generation to generation that like, if you're, you know, your kid is in grade nine and they're reading, you know, Romeo and Juliet. You say, I remember when I read Romeo and Juliet when I was in grade nine. And of course, that doesn't mean that education should never change. We don't need to teach kids how to use typewriters. We can make smart changes while maintaining some sort of a core. And so this idea of a, of a shared, um, of, a, of a shared common experience of a reservoir of shared experiences as, as, as existing throughout education or just with inside the classroom. Uh, reading the same books also builds up a kind of a, not just a shared vocabulary in the sense that we're kind of learning the same words, but also like a set of uh, experiences that I, you can draw back upon and, and build upon. Um, and so in my grade 11 English class, we, we do three main texts as a class. They do one text independently. And like the final essay is thinking about these different characters in these different books. Um, and, um, you know, anyway, they just, we have, and then I can use examples from the other book when I'm talking about the next book. Like, do you remember how like this character was in this similar situation and did this or that? And what did it say? So think about that in terms of this character is in a similar situation, making a different choice. And like, you just have all, you, you, you build your own examples that, that you can use and draw from. Whereas everyone doing the same thing, um, you don't get to be able to say, you, you remember when this thing? Yeah, so this thing is like that thing. You develop all these little hooks uh, in this, in a, like mental hooks on which you can hang all these different kinds of things. And, you know, you hope that they're still going to be there. That's an excellent point. And I agree. And as a teacher, 
that also makes teaching, in my opinion, a more interesting and challenging and fun activity um, for the teacher. When the kids are all on their own reading all the books, you can't possibly read the books with them. They're too many. Um, and the level of depth you can get to, the amount you can help them think deeply about the characters and about life and what it's what the themes are and so forth, it's much more difficult. And I think also teaching the teaching of writing becomes nearly impossible in terms of ex in terms of analytical writing for that reason. If I haven't read the book and you present me with a thesis, I. I mean, you know, okay, maybe, I don't know. How do you even, how do you even g get into the meat of those ideas with the student and f help them flesh it out, help them understand if these are good examples or not good examples of what they're saying. And now I see them moving away from fiction altogether and towards nonfiction. And even in the nonfiction writings, they are picking articles to read or readings. And it's so superficial. You just, how do you teach the kind of thinking that you would teach in the course of a writing or writing and rhetoric or reading and writing course without shared reading of, of, of the kind that you can analyze. It's not just, this is what it says, you know? And mm -hmm. I think the kids are missing out on that. The teachers are missing out too. So what do you think that does to who gets attracted to teaching? Sorry. I just want to talk about reading and oh, writing sorry. Really quickly. Go ahead. Um, first of all, I mean, it's part of this whole, exercise, I mean, in terms of writing these articles now, is as an English teacher, I need to have my own writing practice, right? I need to keep writing in order to keep, you know, being a good teacher of writing. And, you know, when I need to be sharp and when I see uh, a first draft um, that like I have this really, uh, this fluid kind of sense of, of what I'm looking for and, and what makes sense and how to develop it and how to make it stronger because I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm in it. I, I live it, so to speak. And the other thing with with reading is that, you know, you might have a kid who's a reader and they know how to read. But when it comes to like a novel, but once you make that jump into like a more of a literary world, I think a lot of kids, they just look at it. You know, they just flip through its 200 pages and they just think I can't read a 200 page book. And so you read the first however much. Maybe you can read a third that you go through the class together really closely and you're just sort of guiding them and trying to avoid all of these things that can make people give up. So one of the big things I do when I'm going through a book at the beginning, and there's like unfamiliar vocabulary, but you know, for example, so many words in English, they're either adding or re like removing emphasis. They're emphasizing or de-emphasizing words that, you know, authors, they're not saying very, 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 very something, you know, beautiful. Like they've got this whole, you know, vocabulary to, to draw from. But, you know, usually if you just focus on the nouns, for example, and that, you know, just based on the sentence, do you think that they're adding emphasis to how, you know, like how, how, how beautiful or how ugly this thing looks just based on the other, based on the other things? Um, because I really try to coach them out of looking up every word you don't know. Kids want to open a book and they want to focus on all the words that they don't know. I tell them you have to do the opposite. Ignore the words you don't know. Focus on the words that you do know. And you can allow for your mind, and there, there is an, a, there's an imaginative process that goes along with reading fiction as well. And I would say only look up a word if the whole paragraph really doesn't make any sense without it, that it's so like crucial to understand. Um, so you want to ask me about, about being drawn to teaching. <sighs> it's really hard to say. I think, you know... I think in some ways I was lucky. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a self-aggrandizing to say I'm a born teacher, but I did have people when I was younger telling me that I should be a teacher. And I think that my aspiration was to be a professor. And, you know, I don't have any, you know, bad feelings about, you know, I'm a, I'm a failed academic. I, you know, I'm the, the high school English teacher. Um, you know, I, I just, yeah, I, I love the, the life that I have and the, yeah, I, I don't think that I would really be happy being a professor, honestly. Uh, and so I'm actually really, really lucky the way that it worked out. Um, but who do you think gets drawn? You know, what I'm saying is we, we've we talked about this um, on, on this channel. I talked about it in my Twitter space the other night that when speaking specifically about school choice, which I want to move into next, um, I've talked a lot about the teacher pipeline and what I call the teacher pipeline. In other words, hmm. um, 
almost all teachers, certainly going into public school, but increasingly even into private schools, come out of the same ed schools. Okay, they're not coming out of just college to teaching anymore, you know, from English or history or math. We do have a percentage to do, especially in the independent schools, but even they are uh, fewer and farther between because with the push towards career readiness, we have fewer people majoring in subjects. Okay, so they're, if they major in a subject, it's for example, because they want to uh, go on and get a graduate degree, or they're still going to go to ed school and get that master's, or they're going to be a writer or something like that. They're not, we're not really encouraging people who are subject matter experts to now go take that and go to a school. So they're going to ed school. And with all this praxis and all this self-directed relevant, and you know, we're not going to read the same books and you don't need to be an expert at anything. And you can just implement, implement the uh, the program, I'm wondering if we are and have been for quite some time, and I this is somewhat rhetorical question. I already know my answer. Have been attracting a completely different kind of person to teaching, who you would you know be sitting at dinner with and have very little to talk to them about, actually. Yeah, I, I think that one constant is that I think for a lot of people it is kind of a backup plan. Um, and yet, yeah, I think that, um, there is also something different. I think that you're, that, that you're right about that. Uh, I guess I haven't really thought that much about, you know, who wants to be a teacher. Um, but one thing I think is that one thing that is different, um, you know, there's a, I don't know if you're a Seinfeld fan, but, um, there's a, an episode, the librarian where Bookman is talking about the, li the, the old librarian, you know, we didn't know anything about her. We didn't know about her personal life. She didn't have a personal life. And I think that maybe that's a difference, that we're not really getting these, you know, these kind of, I don't know how to say it, but normal, boring, monochromatic hair, you know, non-piercing people who just want to, you know, just kind of do a, just want to do a good job in this, uh, in, in kind of a conventional way that, I, I don't know, that it does seem to draw uh, maybe it does draw people that are in, more interested in some kind of a uh, social justice kind of ethos, but it's also possible that there's an extent to which that is foisted upon people in ed schools. So I don't know. I know it's, it's, a, it's hard. I don't know that we could really find out. Um, I certainly hear from teachers who are in ed school and thinking, what, what, ha ha what happened? I uh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And I feel like they're a born teacher in the wrong place. And I have, in fact, encouraged several of them to leave and try to go, as your article pointed out, be a free agent, go teach. You love kids. You love your subject matter. You, you have what you need. Go teach. You know, don't, I hate to tell somebody, you know, drop out of school, especially if they put, put money into it. But if you're not getting something out of this or you feel like you're being browbeaten into doing things or thinking things that you don't want to think, then it's, you should, it's your life. You shouldn't be there. But when we were talking earlier about the way that teachers are no longer engaging with students in the same way and it's more a uh, presenter style or, you know, here, you're going to learn this, or you're going to go do this, go. I think it's, tailor-made for a more performative style of person. Hmm. So the person who ends up being a good teacher and award-winning teacher in schools today or the one that captures the eye of the administration and, you know, gets all kinds of accolades is the one who can engage the students and have the students to like run into the classroom and be like, we love you. You're the best, whatever. And there is something performative about that. That, you know, you're getting, and we also live in a social media culture where we're, people are encouraged to be performative, you know, 24 hours a day in front of a camera, even just from their bedroom. So, and now you're in a, in a classroom and you literally have people, all these little eyes on you and your big eyes on you. And I just think that a person who shies away from that kind of evaluation or limelight or critique would just not want to go into teaching. It's be like, Ew, you know, or they'd want to teach at a different kind of school, and those kinds of schools are harder to find. So that was why I I, I asked it. I I just am seeing see. a personality type that schools seem to value this really basically this this production um, that that 
what whatever active or engaged means, more and more it just becomes superficial. Like you said, looking in the classroom, it should look like, I don't know, it should resemble, you know, what, what should it resemble? Should it look like, you know, a party or should it look like church? Uh, and I think that the answer is very clear based on um, what, what we currently see. But there's no way to really look into a classroom. I mean, if, if all the students are really deep in thought, for example, or they're really, you know, um, deeply paying attention, right? And they're developing this regime of attention uh, that is very hard fought and hard won. Like, you know, the kind of things that you need to start to develop if you're going to be studying for, you know, your... Your, your law exam or your medical license. I mean, those are long, long hours in a library with a book. And you don't just go from party time to being able to do that. It's something that you have to, you have to kind of build up a resistance and an immunity to. And you have to be able to, you know, thrive in, in kind of a low stimulation, um, effortful way. And so this is, you know, I'm always thinking about student-centered and teacher-centered. And it has a lot to do with the way that we think about interest and effort. So I think this new model is that kids are not going to, you know, work hard. They're not going to apply any effort unless they're interested. And, and so, yeah, you need a lot of these kind of little, these gimmicks, right? Teaching has become more and more gimmicky, I think. Um, but I think that there is this, this older idea is that you continue to devote effort. And if you do that, you are going to find what is so interesting about it, that effort can precede interest. You don't necessarily have to have interest that precedes effort. I could not agree more. I, I'm so glad you said that because I, I've, I've just, I feel like a rebel, you know, so many people are telling me like, but you know, if a student isn't interested, they're not going to learn. And I'm like, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but a student can't be interested in something they don't know about. They've never heard of it before. They've never encountered it before. They've never had to wrestle with it. They can only be interested in what's right in front of their face, like, or what they've seen and only a subset of that. So it's our job, I believe, as adults, all adults, but especially teachers who are entrusted with the children's growth and development to introduce them to things they could be interested in and to nudge them a little to give themselves a chance and give the material a chance. I, some of the things I became the most interested in were things I never in a million years would have thought I'd be interested in. And Shakespeare was on that list. What, the first time in ninth grade, when our English teacher said we were reading uh, Romeo and Juliet, and I heard, you know, Shakespeare, I was like, oh, my God, you know, because all I'd ever heard was about Shakespeare. It's hard. Old yeah. words. Right. And mm -hmm. we read the original. None of this. No fear. Shakespeare garbage. OK. And initially I was scared to death. That was probably where a lot of my disdain was coming from. Like, I'm not going to understand it. And I was always a good English student. So I thought this is going to be my failing. I'm not going to do well. But this teacher, first of all, so loved it. And he came from a drama background. So he really wanted to dig into this play, right? And by the end of that class, I loved Shakespeare. I didn't just like, that wasn't so bad. I was like, I am indebted to this teacher for the rest of my life because I never would have picked up Shakespeare ever, ever, ever. I would have been like, ew, not touching that. That's old crusty stuff from old people. And by the end of that, I was just so immersed in the language. I was so in love with the use of words. I remember even thinking, even then in ninth grade, like this is the dumbest story ever made beautiful because of the words. <laughs> you know, I just, the music of it. And that, his love of the material gave that to us. Yeah. I wouldn't have been interested without it. Contagious. Yeah. And, uh, it should be. So I guess if you if you find yourself making this kind of argument again, you could say something like, is it okay to quit something if you lose interest, right? If you sign your kid up for a sport and after a practice or a game says, yeah, I'm not really interested in baseball anymore. Well, you're going to stick with it. Or do you say, because schools have a part in, in, in sort of forging that foundation of 
uninterested attention. And it also manifests in work. I mean, if, you know, your, your spouse says, you know, I'm not really interested in my job. Like I'm just not going to go tomorrow. Um, <laughs> no, of course or not. This marriage, I mean, or this marriage or this marriage. Yeah. Um, so there's that there too. Is, yeah. You have to stick with things. And I mean, there are a lot of things in life. Now, you, you graduate kids like slowly, um, you probably want to give them a very small load of like disagreeable tasks, but the best thing, they have to come out the other side of a disagreeable task with some kind of energy because thinking back to Stearns in this book about overcometh, the world belongs to people who overcome things that they maybe don't want to do. And that's who the world is going to belong to. You don't, you know, you, you don't feel like going to practice or you don't feel like going to work or, or whatever. Um, it is actually a loving thing, I think, to say, too bad, you're going. Yeah, it's hard, though. And it's, I mean, I think for after a generation, it's at least a generation that has been, you know, raised and educated to believe that it's cruel, that it's mean to put somebody in a position where they're a little uncomfortable. I'm not talking massively uncomfortable, but like, you know, it's not comfortable that we now have adults and children who believe in something called a right to comfort and yeah. that the number one role of school is to make children feel loved and accepted and that they're actually peddling this lie. I'll straight up say it's a lie that you cannot learn that a child cannot learn until they know they belong they know they belong. They know they're welcome. They know they're loved. They know they're accepted for every single thing about them. And of course, they can't know that until they know all the things about themselves at any young age that they're at, as if they're done, they're fully cooked. Yeah. And then when they know, and then they can demand they're not alienated this is the Marxist concept. And there are people out there stating this, like it's the sun rises in the East. Like, this is true. This is true. And I see parents who hear it and they're like, well, okay, they're telling the experts are telling me that my child can't learn unless these things are true. And part of me wants to shake them and say, "You were a child. Do you not remember anything? <laughs> like, come on, remember. Snap out of it. Wake up from your fog. You were a kid. That wasn't true for you. That wasn't true for your parents. It wasn't true for your grandparents. Why are children? They're still human, right? They're not some new species. They're not." so different from you the world moving on and modernizing didn't change the human species but they yeah. believe it yeah so some of this stems from there was a particular video i think the woman's name is rita pearson and it's this idea that you know kids don't learn from people they don't like uh and anyway i remember probably the fourth or fifth time in ed school when you know some teacher was playing it or putting it on and all the rest of it kind of crumbled grumbled and said no we've, we've already seen this like five times and anyway it's obviously wrong right this idea that kids don't learn from people they don't like um probably some of the biggest lessons you've ever learned in your life probably came from someone that you may not have liked i mean that it's not a very well established correlation of liking and learning and uh so there's the the, the teacher phrasing is that Kids have to know you care before they care to learn. But again, I think that there's something, you know, so, you know, kids, they're just allowed to opt in or opt out of any kind of learning or lesson or task if they want to or not. Uh, I think that there's just too much instability in that. I think that, you know, most kids, they want to know really that like the teacher is the authority and that there's someone in charge and that like that creates the stability and that they know who they can go to if there's something wrong or if there's a problem. Um, and, but the bigger thing here, I already talked about effort and interest, but another different way to think about this, this whole structure is what comes first happiness or success. And what I think you're describing is this idea that kids have to be happy first. And if they're happy, then they're going to be able to become successful. Um, or is it that you first have to, become a success. You establish yourself in your life or your career or whatever it is that you want to be good at. Get good at something. And that out of that achievement, uh, triumph, uh, whatever it is, then you're going to start to find more and more happiness. And so effort before interest and success before happiness. 
and let happiness and let all the interests, all the things you find interesting in your life, let those things come later. And I think that that is, you know, much more the, the world that I'm living in, this sort of more of this, this more academically based um, private international school um, that, yeah, effort and success are much more emphasized. And it's not because we're cruel. It's because we believe ultimately that interest and happiness can take care of themselves if there's this foundation of effort and success. I love that. And I think boundaries are really important. And what I'm noticing about today's crop of more left-leaning teachers, activist teachers, is not only do they not seem to um, respect you know, boundaries, but they don't seem to understand what they're for. And what you've just described helps I hope helps the audience of parents and maybe potentially other teachers understand that, you know, the boundaries are not just there to be mean, they serve a purpose and there it's a purpose that the children, the children need. Now, before we started speaking or started recording, we were having a little chat and you did talk about meaning. You made, you made some comments. I was wondering if you can sort of tack onto what you were just saying, the stuff that we talked about, about, children forming meaning. Mm -hmm. First thing I always think about this, the a distinction between purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. um, you could have a, a purpose, which is kind of a, a, in a limited sense, which is just knowing that what you do is, you know, um, somehow important either to yourself or to somebody else. Um, whereas I think, yeah, it's, it's very natural that we're all, we're all searching for meaning and we're all trying to find it. And, I think that you know maybe there is a, a kind of a trap in thinking that we need to give kids lots of you know open, free, unstructuredness in order to be able to find meaning. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of meaning that can be found um, just through you know pursuing some kind of path that's been laid out or, or set out before you. Um, so I think that. What happens no. to kids if they don't, if, if, what can happen to a child if they don't have that, if they don't have any sense of, uh, or even an understanding of how they might individually go about filling that need? Yeah, it, it can sort of create a vacuum and then they start to kind of search for things much more on their own and independently and, you know, it can be very hard to know, you know, what kinds of things it might be or, or where that might lead. Um, there's a sense that, I mean, there is still something to this idea that we want to sort of keep them on a kind of a straight and narrow path and that there are things that, that there are, you know, restrictions and like you said, boundaries, but that these things, they're, they don't, they don't kill creativity, right? This idea that like most like I think of the example of art that sure art is just this kind of like, it can be this wild, crazy, expressive thing, but there's also these like extremely, you know, delicate, like, you know, painting the way that something actually looks or drawing a sort of a, a realistic, like that there's so much technique that goes into it too. And I think that, you know, having uh, like structure and, and foundation and, and kind of, um, being able to, you know, recognize, you know, familiar structures that I think that that does a lot. And I, I think that in many ways there is a kind of, um, let's just say a kind of a stereotype that, you know, hardworking kids, for example, Asian kids, that they're smart and hardworking and they're good at math, but they're not creative. Mm. Um, but, but I think that, I mean, I don't really think that it's true uh, in, in some ways, maybe, you know, not as um, maybe not as like as outspoken or as, as verbose or something like that, more kind of, I don't know, uh, it, it's hard, hard to say with across cultures because there's so much individual difference. Right. Sure. But yeah. Well, I think, you know, there, I'm going to go back to your article now because I want to segue into talking a little bit more about what you were saying about school choice and born teachers. We've talked about born teachers. We've talked about the difference between them and made teachers superficially. Um but you mentioned in your article that a born teacher, just like the people I've been advising to like leave ed school and go off on your own, they do have choice. They already have school choice. They can go seek out. They're you know 
free agents. They can go seek out a school where they can teach as they see fit. They can open a micro school. They could leave teaching altogether and go do something else. So they have, they already have choices. And when they either leave the profession or put themselves into situations that suit their style of teaching, the, the standardized system, the primary system that most students have to go to has a dearth of born teachers and then in come the other teachers. So this is what you said. Without born teachers, you end up with a higher concentration of activists who, instead of setting political loyalties aside, superheat schools. Thus, they fail to mediate the relationships through the subject or content knowledge. We just talked about that. This opens the floodgates to unprofessionalism right down to teachers wanting their kids to love them in return just as much as they love them. This love is a false virtue in a teacher. These are not born teachers. They are made teachers. They've been manufactured by progressive, woke, student-centered ed schools. They are the DEI, CRT, SEL, derelicts. See, infusing politics is a breakdown in distance teachers ought to have. Teacher preachers. And then this part's really important. I want the audience to zone in on this. And then the therapeutic over facilitation of students' emotions is a second breakdown. It is too intimate to be professional teacher creepers. So they've taken it past even the teacher preacher to the teacher creeper. Now they've got this person coming into the inside the kid's head and a born teacher doesn't want to go there. Like that's none of the, there's like a wall. You mentioned frequently in the article that a born teacher should say multiple times a day, go ask your mom or dad, yeah. you know, go ask your parents, go talk to your family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how did you, how did you, I would say figure that out, but how you don't have children yourself and it, you clearly recognize and respect that boundary. Explain mm -hmm. to the audience why, why you think that and why they should be more on their guard when teachers don't do that. Well, part of the, the kind of coming upon this realization is, you know, when I talk to teachers back home and the kinds of things that they're, you know, often dealing with, um, you know, and, and I kind of describe what my world is like, um, that typically they wish they had something more like my situation and I am grateful for my situation, right? Um, I mean, some teachers are really great at, you know, like working with you know, difficult, troubled or, or problem kids. And there are also like, there can be completely different types of great teachers. Um, I mean, one way when I kind of reflect on my teaching practice and why I think I, I'm in a good situation here is that I don't think of myself as a really great um, motivator of really unmotivated students, like this kind of performative kind of thing. But I think that when I've got, you know, like, you know, if they're all falling asleep, you know, it's not easy for me to maintain the sort of Jim Carrey level of, uh, of you know, <laughs> enthusiasm. Um, but I think that, you know, that they do find themselves and they find a lot of like that, that they find that I'm able to answer their, their most difficult questions. Uh, that, of course, sometimes you have to say you don't know when you don't know. Um, but if you're reading and thinking along with them, then that you're able to. But what I'm talking about here are these two very different dimensions of professionalism. But, but, even, but it all pertains to temperature. I think of you want to keep the temperature down. You want to keep things cool. Um, so the first dimension of professionalism is that the subject mediates or it lives in between the relationship, right? So, yeah, it's just like a wall, but it's a, it's a, it's a clear wall. It's like a, a glass, you know? Uh, that, you know, you, you don't touch each other, for example, is it kind exactly. of a good analogy. Um, and that my relationship with them still, you know, grows and it still, you know, it still has this warmth to it because, you know, someone like teaching you something that you do feel like that they care. But, yeah, I care about you only insofar as I care about your success and I care about how much you learn. And I mean, I certainly care that they, you know, enjoy, you know, the class. Um, but it's it's indirect. So the, the the relationship is indirect because it's mediated by the subject. And that also helps to maintain this distance um, because ultimately students, like a student is in a di different mode than like the child at home. So when you're at home, you are in like private. And when you are at school, you're in public. 
and that there is a different, but th there's a difference. There, there are different set. There's a whole different, you know, code of appropriate, you know, behaviors um, that that manifest in these two different ways. Everyone kind of has, basically, everyone has a double life. Um, that we all have our home life in the way that we are, um, right. and that's different from the way we manifest in public. And so, my students exist in public ultimately in a in a professional way. Doesn't mean that it's all strictly professional or, or cruel or harsh, um, but that is the other the other thing is that the, the mediation through the subject, the knowledge, the content, but that also the relationship is not therapeutic. That we don't really get into anything that's personal or emotional. And so by keeping things indirect and cool and not therapeutic and by being able to defer, you can say, go ask your mom or, you know, I can also defer disciplinary things to the principal that I, I don't want to be doing everything. I really want to stay in my lane. And this is the great gift to born teachers is that in those things, you find how free you are to be able to teach. I don't want to be your parent. Okay. I mean, I've got 60 students. I don't want to have 60 kids, right? That like I'm, I'm obligated to meet their basic needs because uh, there'd be absolutely no time left over for these other higher, more intellectual needs that anyway are way more interesting and way more fun for me, right? I would yeah. rather talk to them about, you know, about books um, than about, you know, whatever problems they're dealing with. Maybe like every once in a while, sure, um, there are these really exceptional situations, but usually that's just, is very reluctant. I'm never like seeking out that kind of relationship, but sometimes, you know, you are a teacher, you're an adult, you're a grown up that they know in the community. And that if sometimes if they don't know who to talk to, they can go talk to you. But there's also this really important concept, a part of teacher professionalism that is called appropriate disclosure. And it's probably something that we should all say at the very beginning, um, but usually it never comes up for me. So it's not something I, I almost feel like by bringing it up, I could feel like I'm inviting that. But right. basically it says, I do not like, we don't have teacher student confidentiality. Like I'm not your doctor or your lawyer. Right. And so like anything that you tell me, I may have to tell somebody else. Right. Like right. I am not a, a, a secret keeper. Um, you know, like, I mean, there are some, there are some gray areas. Right. Um, you know, like if I'm talking to a parent and, you know, I know that their daughter is dating this boy, you know, it, it can be a gray area of like, should I tell her? Maybe she already knows, maybe she doesn't. Um, and so I don't know, there can be a lot of factors there, but, but basically, yeah, the whole point is by keeping things professional and cool that it lets you to be free. You don't want to get yeah. over involved so you can do all the other fun, interesting things. Yes. And you have a new piece out today called Kids Lib. And I really want, I want parents to subscribe to your newsletter, but I read it all. But you definitely need to read these two pieces. The one I talked about before, the school choice and the trappings of woke, and then Kids Lib out today. I'll put the link in the description box. Um, because it speaks to this, you know, the first of all, the double life, you know, the public life and the private life in the home, but how they're now they're kind of like getting very blurry. And you mentioned that if this is going on and getting into this creeper mode, right? We say groomer, creeper, whatever you want to call it. Um, then we, we have to stop it, but it may be required that parents understand where it comes from, because I know I've brought it up before and I mentioned to people and it's so hard to believe it's so different from when they went to school. A lot of parents will say, I didn't know my teacher's first name, much less their sexuality, whatever that a lot of them, I think go into immediate denial. The cognitive dissonance is so profound that they just can't, they don't want to think about it. It's too awful, especially if they feel like they have to leave their kids at the school each day because they don't have another solution. So yeah. you've written another piece about the kind of the origins of this and the, the ideas, the Marxism and the liberatory ideologies and movements that this may come from. And I think it's really, really important for parents to read this article and understand here. I'm just going to read a couple a couple pieces from this. You say many parents see a much darker side to this. You know, this is this blurring of lines and may struggle to understand what they perceive to be the sexualization or, or grooming of kids in school these days. Maybe it isn't all that important to understand it. We just need to stop it because it's evil. Unless of course you can't stop it until you understand it. And I think you're onto something. I think you're right. I don't think they can. So here we go. And then you explain. And 
one of the things that you mention is you go through the different movements, right? Of the uh, the first one being um, with Marx that that sort of like the the rich have oppression over the poor, right? The 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 class structure, and then with feminism, then we moved into women's lib where it was kind of like men have oppressive power over women. Well, what is the gender thing? How does this fit in? And you nailed it. You nailed it. The neo gender, this kind of new liberatory movement is that parents are oppressive to their children. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen teachers do this. I've seen therapists do it. I've seen, it's not just in education. It's in medicine. It's in, you know, psychotherapy. It's now making its way into the institutions, this new liberatory movement that parenting itself, discipline of any sort. And so of course, when a teacher expresses any kind of discipline, does anything disciplinary, that's too much like parents, right? We're supposed to be your buddies, we're your friends, or we're your compadres or, you know, that, that is implying, I mean, it's quite explicit at this point, keep, I'll keep your secrets. Your parents are abusive and oppressive when they exert any authority over you whatsoever. And to my way of thinking as a parent, that makes a school that doesn't explicitly repudiate this, not just, oh, we don't do that, but I mean, they have to explicitly have a code of ethics and say, we will never do that and our teachers will be fired, you know, that any school that doesn't go out of its way to make sure that you know where the line is drawn and the teachers respect it is quite literally dangerous. Yeah, I think that this kind of goes back to this. Again, I think about this temperature thing and that there's this this whole born and made teacher. And I think that parents have a very different ideal for what they want a teacher to be versus the kind of teacher that education itself or ed schools are trying to produce. And I think it's reasonable that parents would assume that ed schools like that were, were training teachers. That's the kind of teacher that parents would want. Right. And I think, I mean, basically the, the argument that I'm taking in that piece is, is that no, um, that that is, that is incorrect uh, because you don't want this kind of emo like this, this over emotional over involvement um, that like almost sure the teacher can kind of be someone that the kid can go and talk to, but you don't want it to start going in the other direction where there's almost a kind of a, of a hunger that, that a teacher or, or any kind of professional might have and say, like, you know, confide in me, like that you can trust me and like I'm the one that you can trust, you know, with your secrets or, or however you want to express yourself um, is fine. And that it, I don't know, that there's just this, this sense that it can kind of take on a life of its own. Um, whereas, again, that it's, it's just, it's too direct. It's not mediated through this professional role or this professional boundary. And yeah, uh, certainly boundaries are very important, but not in therapy, right? And like, like therapy is very, you know, it's sort of sharing secrets and it's totally confidential. And this, this, the, the therapeutization of education is actually an old problem. It goes back at least to the eighties. And like the, the earliest form was probably what's called the self-esteem movement. And this, this self-esteem movement has really turned into um, SEL, which I think that it, it's reasonable to be skeptical of as to whether or not it's, it's really something that, I mean, is this, I mean, it sounds like therapy is available to, to kids who really need it, but actually it can become more infused into like every level of teaching. And again, once you start getting into these emotional things or when you get into politics, right? Like there's the therapeutic side, but there's also the political side. And these things, they just, it just heats up the classroom too much. Um, whereas I think, you know, parents think that they're, you know, that the classroom is a very kind of cool, calm environment where they're just learning things that they don't know. They're learning, like, what did you learn at school today? And you're learning about the world. You're not so much like learning about yourself like a person does when they're in therapy because you know parents i think they they would they couldn't imagine that they're sending their kids to you know to into a, a therapeutic situation you know lie down on the couch and tell me your tell me your secrets and tell me your fears kind of thing um, right. because it's because that that's not how, what school is it's not how they understand it right 
it's it's not and and they are getting confused and i think what what a lot of parents are missing is that the confusion forces them to make a choice it's not a conscious choice i don't think they're suddenly going hmm mom the teacher you know <laughs> but they're spending 8 hours a day at school if i mm -hmm. feel uncomfortable to the level of you know distress um i'm going to have to I'm going to have to make a choice and it's more likely they're going to start to trust the teacher. Or they're going to feel like maybe they're right or whatever. And then if they see the parent activists, a parent activist fighting with the teacher about this, it might reinforce what the teacher is saying. See, see what I mean? Right. It's almost becomes like your childhood best friend who's saying your parents are too strict. And then the parent does something strict. See, I was right. So I, I feel like, it's just setting people up for um, setting parents up for, for a fight with the teacher or to be yeah. silenced by the teacher. And I don't think this is a healthy dynamic in general. And that brings me to kind of the school choice thing. We've been trying to, we've been trying to get there, but all this is so fascinating and important. We have to, our parents, we need to understand everything that Dan is saying, because when you approach the topic of school choice, as it is currently structured, manifested, talked about in the United States as you're going to have money to go to a different school, to take your child to a, out of the school where they are, the public school, presumably, into a private setting or possibly to homeschool them. Um, and that, here you go. Here's another option that could help solve your problem. Now, wherever you are, whether it's the academics are not cutting it or it's the woke stuff I got to get my kids out or a combination of both. And most parents I talk to, it's a combination, uh, probably a little heavily on the woke side. I hope more of you will wake up to the fact that it's pretty equally weighted. The academics on, in a woke school are not going to be good. So that what Dan's describing about the born teacher versus a made teacher could quite possibly be the most important factor to consider because taking your kids to another building filled with made teachers even if they're precluded from teaching so much woke stuff because it's a religious school or something like that, you have to ask yourself, I said it on the Twitter space the other night, what is education to me? What do I, what did I want out of my child's education? What am I imagining should go on in school? What kind of learning should be happening? What kind of relationship to materials should my child have? What kind of relationship with a teacher should my child have? This speaks to the teacher. And the pedagogy, you talk about pedagog pedagogical choice, but if the pedagogy is whatever it is, the teacher is going to teach to that pedagogy, only a born teacher is going to rebel against that pedagogy and be, and you know, so how will school choice solve a problem then, Dan, if you don't have enough born teachers? Right. And you could think about even how deep it goes. And I think that, you know, that's probably the thing that parents care the most about is what, like, what type of teacher do I have? Or really what, what type of person, what, like, what type of professional am I entrusting my, my kids with? And so from there, you can say, well, if you don't like the kind of teacher or teachers that you have at your school or, um, well, okay, what, what type of teacher are they? What type of educational philosophy do they have? What type of educational school did they go to? And if the answer to all of these questions is, well, there's really only one type, right? There is an ideal that is being made uh, by this, by, I don't know, you could call it big education, uh, that it is very much rooted in what's called critical pedagogy, um, that the, the term that I always think of is student-centered, and that you have student-centered teachers coming from student-centered ed schools that's all based on student-centered philosophies. And that there's probably the, the best term is monopoly, that there's a monopoly of an idea in education and that that, that could um, cause what some people have called this kind of a school choice trap, that basically what you could find that you end up with is same school, different name. That's right. And that's not... Um, so... 
I think that I still think that sure there are different kinds of teachers. It, it, I don't want to make it sound like it's all doom and gloom and that it's hopeless and that no matter what, um, you're going to be kind of subjected to this. But again, it's very important this idea of uh, what is the ideal kind of teacher that a parent wants versus the ideal, um, you know, like versus what the parent wants versus what education is producing. And again, all this talk about you know effort and interest and happiness and success that if all of these teachers are being given what I would consider a lot of bad ideas, that they need to focus, for example, on like the happiness, not the success, and the interest, not the effort, that that, it's, that already is setting you up for a non-academic kind of experience and for a too therapeutic environment. Like, what are you interested in? And, and, and you know, what do you, what makes you happy? And, you know, what are you passionate about? This idea of passion. Um, Versus, you know, effort and success. And I think a school and I think my, cl my classroom should be dispassionate in the way that science is dispassionate, right? You don't get too attached to any kind of idea that it's kind of neutral and objective. And it's not trying to change the world in some big way. Um, like the born teacher realizes that you, know, you don't try to change the world by, you know, really heavily influencing like you know, someone else's kid's development or their worldview, like that a lot of teachers, they're almost strangely too ambitious in a wrong way. And I think it is, it's endemic in the whole, like the DNA of education um, that they really want to make their mark because for whatever reason they don't, it's not really commonly held that you can change the world enough just by being a good, reliable teacher, uh, by being well-prepared and, and going to work every day and doing your duty just as a just as a professional the way that our teachers did for us when we were kids right that's so true and I think you know even if to your point that you know I don't want to preach doom and gloom either I mean I think if um if you could take your your voucher ESA money whatever and 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 use it to as leverage, with new schools and say, I'm only going to give this to places where I have what I perceive to be more teacher choice. And I don't mean down to the individual person, although with homeschooling, you can do that, by the way, just, you know, a little plug, but, um, but down to, you know, I want to see what, you know, what the pedagogical bent of your school is. I want to understand to whom you are beholden, like who's really running this. If they're accredited, it's the accreditors. Mm. If they use a lot of standardized testing, it's the testing companies. They teach up to the test, right? So which also can go to the accreditor. If you're getting money from other sources like donors who expect certain things. So in other words, to what degree am I the customer? To what degree is that relationship between teacher, child, and me, you know, uh, one that is that relationship that exists as opposed to once I hand my kid over, that's it. I'm, I'm, I've signed on the dotted line on a contract and I'm not even permitted in the United States. There are a lot of um, independent school enrollment contracts where you absolutely sign away your freedom of speech. You say, if I criticize the school publicly or even privately to the school, I'm out. My, my kids can be kicked out. And so that has a silencing effect and parents are very loath to say anything. And how do you, how is it your, how is it more your choice than the public school, which at least has a school board meeting? If you can't even do that, you can't even, you can't criticize it. You can't go to the teacher's boss and say, you know, this teacher was talking about his or her sex life with my kid. I'm not happy about that. Well, then go there's the door that that's not improving things. So even if those those watching might say, well, you know, once the money starts to move and the parents start to move and that'll, that'll create critical mass and that'll put pressure and there'll be competition. And then the ed schools will have to change. And that's asking that voucher to do a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. The example you, that you're giving me of an individual, I would say there's no chance uh, because I mean, all of these schools are student centered and they're all infused with, you know, therapeutic SEL and um, and activistic, um, you know, all, all th these these nine letters: D E I C R T S E L. So, as an individual, I would say no. You don't like. You could just go and say, you know, I'm not going to. If I send my kid here, they're coming here to school. They're not coming here for politics. They're not coming here for therapy. They're coming here to learn because I want them to have 
an academic foundation. Um, and, and ultimately, I mean, for me, there's a very, a lot of people would probably just call it elitist, but ultimately we're giving them all these tools and gifts and education that they are going to be able to, you know, experience this kind of um, what we might call like the great conversation um, of like, you know, like the, you know, the great Western canon and, um, you know, the greatest things that have ever been said and thought and written. And uh, it takes a long time to be able to get up to that point. And is so is that the end point that the school is trying to get like? And so as an individual parent, um, is the school's mission aligned with you? And if you find that it doesn't, uh, do you have any recourse? I, I would say I'm very skeptical on an individual basis. And um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of great groups and it, it's just going to take a lot of, uh, of, you know, cooperation and organizing and, you know, really coming to see, you know, what are the schools that are really serious insofar as a school is a place where serious work is to be done and that the study in school, sure, um, it's, it's fun and it's social, but also it has to be exact and exacting that it has to demand like, you know, precision and hard work because these are virtues we want people to have later in life. This idea that I want my kid just to you know, just have like fun and freedom and then they'll be serious and hardworking later, I think is a delusion that you have to start gradually, right? We're not like, you know, we don't have four hour lectures for little children. Of course, that's ridiculous, but you have to start, you know, building these kind of academic skills um, and, and start to introduce them to what, what I call their, their, their intellectual inheritance, right? All of this, all of the richness of, of Western culture and of civilization itself, going back to, you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, right. and, uh, and the, it's, it's a worthwhile goal to try to get there. And there's, I mean, I, I just don't really see what, what politics and therapy have to contribute to that to that right. intellectual development. I think the challenge is people feel ill-equipped to defend the things you just said are worthwhile learning. So this has been going on for some time now. So it's not like we have the today's parents went to a school very similar. They didn't necessarily learn the rich tradition. They, they got rid of Western Civ as a required uh, type of course of study in college even before I went to college and I went to college in the early eighties. Um, they've been shoving the classics farther and farther out. In some cases getting rid of classics departments altogether in colleges, in high schools, they started moving away again. Also in the late seventies, early eighties, they started moving away from the knowledge-based curriculum. And so parents, when they, there might be parents watching this who hear you talk about the rich tradition that, their kids, you know, are not going to get and all that. And they wouldn't know how to defend that because they don't necessarily perceive it as such. So they, they might, there might be anywhere in a spectrum from, yeah, that does sound kind of important, but I can't really articulate why all the way to naked hostility towards Western culture and civilization. You mean the horrible, oppressive, colonialist, uh, misogynistic, patriarchal evil that destroyed the planet with capitalism? You mean them, those people? So, you know, you've got this range of parents and believe it or not, there are parents here who also want homes, who want a uh, school choice. There are parents over here who like really don't have that much of a problem with the movement away from Western civilization being centric in the teaching in school. Uh, but they just think it's being done, you know, whatever's being done is to, they don't want the gender stuff or they're, whatever they're learning isn't, they're not learning enough math or it's not um, career focused enough. And that's a whole other show. I, I would love for you to come back on a separate show and talk about the whole career versus knowledge thing. But we, we, we've we been talking so long. I don't want to take up more of your time. It's getting late there. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. they don't know how to defend it. How do I, how do I argue for Western civilization when everyone in every institution in the country in which I live is saying it's terrible? First, on the pedagogical front, what you're going to hear is that these kinds of courses, they're too hard and they're too boring. And so what I would say to that is, for whom? You want me to believe that these are too hard and too boring for my kids, but maybe you think they're too hard to teach. And maybe you think that it's too boring to teach. 
And so the second point that you made is this, this woke political point about, oh, you want us to pass on and continue this evil, awful, horrible, no good culture of, you know, Western civilization. I would say, where are you going? I mean, if it's so horrible here, I mean, where in the world, I mean, what's, what's the, what's the culture that that's got it right? I mean, where, where are you going? If you, if you hate it here so much, uh, no, you're here in this place, probably because you maintain that this is the best place to be. And the reason for that is because of all of these things that you are expressing insufficient gratitude and appreciation for. But the fact that you're here tells me that you do appreciate them and you are grateful for them. And since somebody gave them to you, you should give them to somebody else. I love that. I feel like that was like a perfect place to end right there. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's that I, I keep saying to people, like, what is your legacy? What do you want to give to your children? And what did you want to give them? You're looking down at your little baby. And what is it you're thinking? You know, like, oh, I want to give you nothing but angst and hatred for your little land in which you were born. I don't think that's a great gift. But um, I, I, you've given you've given us so much with these just these two articles. I Everyone needs to read them. Thank Is there you. anything else you want to say? Yeah. In closing, I kind, please. I kind of, I kind of blanked when you asked me about the, you. You were teeing me up for the meaning thing, and I kind no, of like fine. forgot yeah, what I wanted ahead. to say. Go ahead. But this idea about keeping a lot of like free, open, unstructured play for kids, um, and not not overburdening them with academics, and not giving them sort of all this pressure to succeed, um, because it's just it's too stressful on them, and. What I would say is, so your kids who aren't really being pushed hard academically, how's their stress level? How's their mental health? I mean, has that yes. skyrocketed? And now we have all these happy, healthy, well-adjusted kids since we've ostensibly, you know, lowered standards for you know academic achievement. Or are those things getting worse? And this almost kind of goes back to this idea of kids, they need to have a mission, they need to be given something to do, they need to, they need to have a path. Because if they don't have a path, um, then they can start, they can basically go off the path. Or a better, a better way to put it is about idle hands. That we, we imagine we have this false assumption about human nature. That if we give them this freedom that they're going to, you know, discover their, you know, ultimate, you know, potential for being or something like that. Um, but there is also the side of just idle hands. Uh, well, idle, idle hands are the devil's playground, but... You know, it, it doesn't have to be in a religious sense. It's just when you don't give them something, you know, healthy and structured and productive to do, then don't be surprised when they're doing unhealthy, unproductive things. That's right. That's right. And they also don't exist in a vacuum. They're living in a, in a world full of influences, full of people trying to get their attention and trying to get them to do different things for a variety of reasons, for the, the very same horrible capitalist, materialistic, whatever that they criticize. Um, you know, it, I'm not going to call it capitalist, but there are people out there who try to get all of our attention, even as adults. So yeah. what are you going to put in your child's frame of reference? What are you going to direct their attention towards? What do you want to tell them is of value and where they should focus? I think we're so allergic to the word should at this point. And then we wonder, how did they become so feral? I don't understand. Well, that's how. And I, I, I am so glad you brought us back to that because that is, that is a great point. They will, uh, they, they will find something else to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. that when the absence of that rigor, the other thing I've tried to explain to people is that competence builds self-esteem. I don't care what age you are when you're a little kid learning to walk, look, the biggest smile they get on their faces when they finally don't fall down. And how many times do they fall down before they don't fall down? Many times. How many times do they not quite get the spoon all the way in their mouth or they spill the cup or whatever before they figure it out? And then they finally do, look what I can do. I can drink from a cup. <laughs> yeah, I would say that self-esteem is the wrong place to start because yeah. we have to remember that there's an older idea before self-esteem and it's just called esteem. Esteem is social and public and it's earned from other people from doing something good, like, wow, great job. Um, not just the more kind of therapeutic, no matter how good it is, you kind of just say good job anyway, especially for, you know, little ones that are, you know, just trying. But there is this earned esteem. 
And that once you are able to, again, perform and do good things and feel like you're successful at something, uh, then you're building your own self-esteem engine uh, that can be a kind of a constant source that you don't need self-esteem given from some external thing. That once you're able to earn and generate your own esteem, then you're able to create your own uh, self-esteem steam engine uh, in an internal sense in your mind. Uh, yes, you're right. And that's why it's so important when you're looking at a school, any school, public, private, or whatever, what is the currency? What is the sort of esteem currency of that environment? So if they're showing you around the building and they're pointing to, and this was our community-based project where they sacrificed, 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 gave, 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 gave. And here's the thing where they set aside their own needs and did this, did, 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 did. and here you see how we celebrate, we celebrate, celebrate, pride, 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 celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. What they're telling you is this is the currency, this is what we esteem in this institution. Your child, therefore, will be esteemed or not esteemed against these metrics. So they're going to, kids are laser sharp. I mean, if there's one area where they're pretty consistently on the ball with this, is very quickly, you know, figuring out where they rank in that and what they have to do to get that esteem. And now I grant you, some kids are just born inner steel and they'll be like, I don't care. I don't need that, whatever. But they're very, very few. They're outliers. The vast majority of all of us wants to fit in. We want to be esteemed by the people around us, with the adults, the children, the everybody. And if that's what I got to do to be liked, to have friends, to be a good person, to get an A, to just basically be comfortable all day and feel like I belong here, if that's the currency for belonging, then I'm probably mm -hmm. going to be inclined to doing it. So the, the adults are telling you loud and clear what they esteem and your kids are picking up on it. And if you allow your child to go to that building, you are saying quite explicitly by your actions, if not your words, me too. I mm -hmm. also esteem these things. And it's going to be a massive disconnect to your child when you come along and try to, I'll just deprogram at a home, Deb. When they come home, I'll just tell them this stuff is all bogus. Do you know how painful that is for your child? Now they're trying, they got to choose between you and the school. They've got to choose which, whose esteem that's triangulation. Do you want to be triangulated with your child's school? That is no place to put your kid. That's not fair. No. That was, some might even call it abusive. Yeah. Yes. I mean, school culture is certainly real. And a school culture that I would call teacher-centered, I, I, I prefer teacher-centered over student-centered, and that's one of my big things. But a, a school culture of esteem and effort and success to me is going to be what I imagine is more aligned with what parents want, not more of a student-centered, um, you know, therapeutic, political school culture of interests and happiness and self-esteem. Yep. I agree. So hopefully I hope, I hope people watching, listening, et cetera, um, will go read the articles to get more in depth uh, about the ideas presented here. But I think we've, we've really dug into them. I will definitely ask you to come back again. Cause I want to talk to you some more about some of the subtopics. Um, there's just so much and I rarely get to talk to teachers and I love talking to teachers cause you're on the front lines. We didn't talk for example, about your experience in Asia. I'm going to want to do that. So everybody like, and share this broadcast and get lots of eyeballs on it. So we can get Dan to come back <laughs> and, um, and get more people reading his content because these are ideas that need to be propagated. He's given us a gift here of perspective that we don't often get. So thank you so, so, so much. Um, and I, uh, everybody, you, you can find Dan on Substack at Dan's newsletter. So that would be uh, unchanging. It's actually unchanging.substack.com. And also correct? there's a pot. Yeah, that's right. There's a podcast, uh, Unchanging Education. We'll have to talk about the podcast sometime next time as well. And I also want to know about your ed school experience and we can kind of compare notes on that too. Yeah, um, so we have so much to talk about. So much yeah. to talk about. It's like, this was like an introductory thing. I'm not sure most of my audience are familiar with you and now hopefully they are. So, and then the, um, the podcast, if you go to Dan's Twitter and I'm going to post that on the screen right now, um, if you go to Dan's Twitter 
you will see a link to the podcast uh, in his bio. And that's at Reifian. Is that right? Reifian. Yeah. Reif to me, he's, he's the antidote to Paula Frieri. It's a guy named Philip Reif. So Reifian, like a follower of Reif. Yeah. Philip Reif. And I'm unfamiliar. So now I have somebody else to read. See, even I'm, I'm, you know, ignorant of a lot of things. I've tried, try to read broadly, but there's always something I learn new. So thank you so much. Everybody go My follow pleasure. Dan, subscribe, et cetera, read the articles. And we will definitely be back with another show, I'm sure. So everybody have a great day, evening, whenever you're listening to this. If you're watching or listening on the replay, thank you. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. All right. Thanks, Deb. You're the best. Thank you.